So our last uh, talk is uh, from Dr. Robin Sherber. She's very interested in patient well-being, and I'm, I was reminded of, of uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, famous comment, ask not what you can do for your country. A ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And, and this is a wonderful way to close, and this, this is intentional. Because, because Robin is going to tell you what you can do for yourself rather than what your doctor can do for you. So Robin, please tell us how we can all help ourselves. She comes from Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale and works very closely with Ruben Mesa. Everyone doing? It's been a good day so far, hopefully. Um, I confess, and it might already be obvious, I am not the person in the room, especially not the speaker, with the most gray hair. <laughs> but that being said, I have been doing research in MPNs for the last decade, and I've worked closely with Dr. Ruben Mesa, who sends his condolences that he's not here today. He uh, he's busy uh, running the cancer center now. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of our research um, in diet, exercise, mindfulness. This is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's a million and one things that we can look at um, that are important for MPN patients. But the general idea is that I think that what we've heard today is absolutely fantastic. It's amazing how far therapies have come. But my concern and where I really want to focus is what are we doing to try to prevent it? What are we going to be doing when not just primary prevention, but what's called secondary prevention? So once, you know, low risk patients, ET, PV, what are we doing to try to prevent that from getting worse? And I honestly think that we need very low risk, what we call scalable interventions or interventions that essentially we could put in a large population. Um, that might actually do some good. Now, it also means the effect sizes might be, might be small, but even small changes over a lifetime might make a big difference in the end. So that's, that's where I'm kind of coming from from this, is what can we do? So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some of our basic work and symptoms, so I won't perseverate on that too much because we have a lot to cover. Uh, and then I'm gonna be talking about some of the interventions that we've put together, both in, again in diet or supplement use, exercise, and then also cognitive interventions. We've heard a lot today about the natural history of the myeloproliferative neoplasms and this idea that once the cells pick up these mutations, uh, especially in that jack signaling pathway, but there's also mutations that can happen, especially in how the DNA of the cells are wound, and those are called epigenetic mutations. We see them a lot as our modifier mutations. Some people might have heard of the words ASXL1, TET2. Those mutations also can feed into the disease, but what we can see is that over time, as these cells pick up more mutations, they start to grow. And specifically in MPNs, this means that you have too many cells that grow. And then over time, we start to see the cells actually not grow as much, and we actually can see the inflammation go up, but we start to lose some of our blood-making uh, capacity. If they pick up too many mutations, they can go into something called acute myelogenous leukemia, or AML. What we see in terms of symptoms is that over time, um, a patient who might have a special baseline health status, might have particular other medical issues going on uh, that might play into symptoms, starts to feel worse. You can get bad inflammation just from the disease itself. You can get vascular events. And there's a lot of PVET patients that might have had a blood clot when they were first diagnosed. And those can play into symptoms. When we start, especially initially, uh, treatment, we start to see symptoms go down a bit, especially symptoms that are related to high blood counts. But over time, we can develop secondary issues, things like iron deficiency, blood clots, more blood clots, medication side effects that might worsen our symptoms. And then over time, we see kind of a waxing and waning of symptoms with different therapies, as we may or may not have different or end organ dysfunction related to the disease. So things like when the spleen gets very big, 
Um, sometimes it can push on our abdomen. You know, again, we can have weight loss. It can affect our liver. We can start to have liver problems. We can get blood clots in the lungs that start to make us feel short of breath or make the lungs not function as well. And over time, I'll be honest, all these things take their toll. We've shown that over 20% of patients with MPNs are at high risk of depression. It's a lot to deal with, especially on a day-to-day -day basis. So ultimately, how can we do things to try to impact the disease course and the symptoms that happen with it? So this is just kind of a, a quick overview of what a lot of our research is focused on, is an understanding symptoms. So what you're going to see here is actually a graph. And on the left, you're going to see the incidence of the symptoms. So how, how common are they? And then as we go down, um, you're going to see that there's going to be different bubbles that pop up. And how big the bubble is, is basically how severe it is. So it may not be a common symptom, but some symptoms are very severe when you do have them. So fatigue is the number one most common symptom in MPN patients. Over 90% of NPN patients will have fatigue. And it's very symptomatic for a lot of different patients. Uh, on a scale of 0 to 10, we saw an average um, severity of around 3. Problem sleeping is the next most common symptom that patients reported. Around 60% of patients reported this. And again, it, it's relatively severe, a little bit less than three. So 2.8 out of 10 was its common severity. Sad mood, again, more than 60% of patients with sad mood. Concentration difficulties, 61% of patients. Feeling full fast or early satiety in over 60% of patients. Problems with inactivity or not moving around very much, 60%. Sexual disturbances, around 57%. And this is something that's often really hard to talk to your doctor about. Night sweats, 56%. Dizziness issues, 55%. Abdominal discomfort, 53%. Bone pain in 48 Headache, 48 as well. Abdominal pain, so overt pain, a little different than discomfort, 48%. Cough in 46, weight loss in 34, and then fevers in around 20%. All these things, like I was saying, add up um, in the landmark survey, which is a large survey of um, uh, the patient experience. We were able to see that emotional hardships, physical hardships, financial hardships, ultimately ended up interfering, interfering with daily activities uh, in a large portion of patients. And that 59% of portion, patients reported feeling worse than their physicians were aware of. And we know that this also comes into how we live our daily lives. This is the um, rate of employment change due to the myeloproliferative neoplasms. And again, you can see that um, although in MF, usually we see a, a, the largest rate of impact on our daily lives, we see quite a bit for essential thrombocythemia and polycythemia vera as well. You've got to think a lot of patients with essential thrombocythemia have very, very long otherwise what were deemed to be healthy lives. So this really can have an impact on your day-to-day -day work, whether or not you necessarily looked healthy. That's a very different thing. We know that symptoms are significantly worse than uh, healthy people of the same age. This was one study where we actually looked at the symptom burden that was experienced in normal healthy folks as well as in patients with MPNs. And what was very interesting is that the MPN patient experience is very similar across the globe. We've seen amazing, amazing results where a lot of the symptoms are almost the same in severity, almost the same in frequency uh, between us here in the US, the UK, Australia. We've looked at uh, different pockets in Japan, in South America, Brazil. Um, Colombia, and it's just um, um, incredible that this patient experience is actually quite a bit shared. So just to kind of go through this, because I, I would feel bad if I at least didn't mention it. So how do symptoms develop in MPN patients? Well, we know that vascular events can be a cause of symptoms. When you have a blood clot, either in your lungs or your abdomen or your legs, a lot of times there's a lot of pain with that. There's also this idea of microvascular symptoms where you may not have an overt blood clot, but there's definitely something going on in the blood vessels that causes some dysfunction there and people can get even things like itching. 
Low or high blood counts can be related back to symptoms, especially low counts when we look at anemia, um, thrombocytopenia related to bleeding. Disease progression can relate back to worsened symptom profiles, especially if someone's transforming from essential thrombocythemia to myelofibrosis, we tend to see symptoms get worse. Organ dysfunction, again, this idea that if you have um, blood production in your livers or in your liver or your lungs, it's not going to work as well. You might feel really short of breath. You might have pretty bad liver dysfunction that sometimes might even cause fluid accumulation in the abdomen. Um, so there's many different types of end organ dysfunction that can happen. And finally, there's this idea that these um, symptoms might be directly mediated by inflammation and this idea that inflammation um, can actually impact uh, the amount of night sweats and fevers that we have. And it's, all, again, all on top of someone who may or may not have the greatest baseline health status. There might be other things going on. There might be bad heart disease. There might be diabetes. We know, again, this inflammation, just to kind of dwell on this a little bit, we've talked about so much inflammation today. But this idea that not only does it, again, relate back to symptoms, but we can see bad inflammation relate back to even nutritional deficiencies, this idea that weight loss, although some of it might be the spleen, some of it might be that you have so much inflammation, your body is not able to absorb as well in the gut, be it from the microbiome or just from the gut itself, not being able to work as properly. We know that this inflammation can contribute to anemia of chronic disease, along with the disease, of course. So the mutant cells will take over, but the normal cells aren't going to grow as well. This idea that we can see inflammation contribute to blood clots, this is something that we're now more than ever realizing is a key part of the thrombotic risk with MPNs. And then again, that end organ dysfunction. So what if we could develop easy techniques that might be um, effective at reducing this inflammation? So that kind of brings us to our next section. We're going to be talking a little bit about um, some of the different ways that we've been looking at and trying to impact potentially not only the inflammation, but the, the general how you feel. And ultimately, although we are still very early, our hope is that someday we might actually be able to help prevent things from getting worse. So the first one is nutrition that I'm going to be talking about. And this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, there is this idea of a Warburg hypothesis. So this is something that they actually thought about back in the 1950s, this idea, and I'm sure you probably have heard of it, that um, metabolic syndromes, especially even things like high glucose, might feed cancer cells. And they've looked at this in solid tumors. So this model is specifically in solid tumors. But what we can see is that through a variety of mechanisms, especially having too much glucose can actually feed cancer cell survival. And this does it through basically encouraging growth, sometimes of fat cells that might actually uh, create more inflammation for the body. This idea that a lot of our hormones and the hormones that are related to diabetes get, can get worse if there's too much blood sugars. Uh, again, the gut microbiome can be affected by this. Um, there can be other um, uh, immune cells that are triggered in high, high environments where we have some sort of metabolic syndrome. And we know that blood cancers are unlike any other types of cancers. They're very unique. I have the hardest time in clinic explaining to people who are newly diagnosed what, what it's like to have an MPN because they get terrified. They're like, is this a cancer? And I'm like, well, it is, but you have to think of it in such a different light. This is something that you could live potentially a long and healthy, somewhat normal life with. But it is something that uh, ultimately we want to make sure what we're trying to do our best to prevent things from happening in. But so few other cancers are like that. This idea that you, we can't cure it, we can't cut it out, but we want to do what we can to try to curb the effects. So we do know that in other disease states, diet can be ineffective. Um, what's been looked at the most is the Mediterranean diet, and specifically that diet has shown reductions in heart disease in basically an overall mortality, or people survive longer with heart disease if they go on the Mediterranean diet. Uh, we have, see inflammatory markers go down in different diets. Again, the Mediterranean diet specifically has seen some markers that we see elevated in MPN patients. And then even markers of blood clotting can go down with different diets. 
But it really brings in the question, too, in, in designing these studies that uh, I, I was struggling with, was this idea of which diet. There's a million and one different diets. And I think the idea is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's a lot of key anti-inflammatory nutritional components that could be potentially beneficial that are incorporated into a lot of these different diets. Um, we know that there's a lot of anti-inflammatory potentials in things like fruits and berries, vegetables, turmeric, nuts, dark chocolate, fish oils, especially things like salmon, green tea, garlic, many other herbs and spices, and whole grains. And so this whole idea that maybe we can kind of try to develop a diet that might be effective, and we might have to try different diets. We also might have to try different techniques. Lately in the literature, it's been very common to do something called intermittent fasting, and intermittent fasting has been shown to have pretty significant effects that might improve the health of someone. They see improvements in microbiome, reduced inflammation, improved insulin sensitivity. So again, maybe the glucose levels might be um, less dysregulated. And we can actually see even improvements in resting heart rate. And just to kind of go through intermittent fasting is this idea that you only eat for a certain hours during the day. So traditionally, people usually pick between noon and 8 p.m. So after 8 p.m. to noon the next day, they won't eat anything. I, they don't necessarily change their diet around at all. It's just this idea that you're giving your body some time without basically the constant supply of nutrients. So this whole idea is what fueled uh, uh, a few years ago now, uh, this idea of a nutrient survey. So we had over um, 1,300 MPN patients from around the globe, 37 countries respond. And we asked them about basically what was their nutrition like, what was their supplement use like? When we looked at nutrition, we saw that there were a high number of MPN patients that said that they needed to be on a certain diet because of allergies or food intolerances. We saw that many patients put themselves on dietary restrictions. Um, and then already, again, without any, any good data in the field, 34% of MPN patients had already put themselves on a specific diet in efforts to try to help control either their disease or their symptoms. We looked at specifically the foods that patients said that they were taking in, and there were some limitations to do this because even as it was, the survey was probably way too long. But the idea that certain foods seem to be associated with improved symptom burden and other foods seem to be associated with worsened symptom burden. But I wouldn't read into this too much. Definitely do not take this as a Bible of what you should or shouldn't eat, <laughs> um, especially because tacos was one that I was really not expecting to pop up <laughs> as significant. But this idea that, I th that a lot of refined foods, a lot of refined sugars, fast foods, fried foods, a lot of those were associated with worsened symptom burden. So it really brought in this idea that I do think that there's a signal here, something that we could do to try to improve at least symptom burden, if not try to help reduce inflammation. Uh, we did ask patients whether or not uh, they would be willing to change their diet or interested. Um, between 96% and 98% of patients would be willing to change their diet to help their control their symptoms or their disease, respectively. So this has led to two different efforts. I won't detail too much here, other than to say that um, uh, one of them has almost completed accrual, and that was the, the nutrient study that uh, I worked with Angela Fleischman at UC Irvine to get that up and running. And specifically, we looked at the Mediterranean diet, and she's seeing early signals in terms of people feeling better. Uh, she has a lot of data analysis left to go through as well. The second efforts that I'm starting up um, are specifically looking, again, at different metabolic states that might impact this cancer cell growth and development and specifically whether or not we can decrease that. And it will be an intensive study specifically looking at this idea of nutritional ketosis. It's a different way of metabolism that you can push your body into. It's not for the faint-hearted, and I certainly would not tell anyone in the room to go on it because it, there can be significant side effects that we're gonna be monitoring for. Things like too much protein can cause renal issues, uh, can cause electrolyte issues. So you have to be careful. One other thing along the idea of nutrition was supplement use. So in that survey, we asked patients about what supplements they were taking. Specifically, the ones that popped up significant were this idea that amino acid supplements and another supplement called N-acetylcysteine were significantly associated with improved 
um, uh, symptom burden. And it was interesting because we actually had already some interest in N acetylcysteine. N acetylcysteine is a supplement that um, regenerates your body's major, basically, anti inflammatory potential or antioxidant potential. I, I won't get into too many of the mechanisms, but essentially uh, free radicals, if anyone's heard of that, or basically bad inflammatory compounds in the body can potentially be somewhat absorbed by this. But n acetylcysteine will go in and kind of regenerate our body's natural mechanism to try to deal with those bad, bad components. It's also been looked at more and more in the literature from everything from allergies to mood disorders to neuropsychiatric disorders to inflammatory disorders, viral illnesses. The list goes on of different people that are looking at N-acetylcysteine in different areas. And one interesting area for me was this idea of N-acetylcysteine and thrombosis, and it's being used in a couple different cardiac studies. Uh, it has some thrombolytic properties, which means that it might help break down blood clots. But that also means it might have an increased risk of bleeding. And as all of you probably know at this point, based on all of our different talks today, there can already be an increased risk of bleeding in MPN patients. So we are also moving forward to looking at this in a prospective clinical trial. And we're going to be hopefully pulling this out into multiple different centers through um, a large uh, cooperative oncology group. Uh, I will say just also N-acetylcysteine back years ago actually showed some initial murine model improvement in uh, MPN markers. So this was a JAK2 mutated mouse model, and they were able to see some improvements in blood parameters, decrease in spleen size, increase in the frequency of, um, uh, or sorry, reductions in the frequency of JAK2 mutated cells. So again, just to reiterate, what should I eat? I do not have any specific instructions for you at this time other than to eat healthy. I would eat lots of foods high in antioxidant potential. I think that that is a healthy thing. A lot of that follows along the Mediterranean diet that has been well studied and has been shown to be safe. I limit your intake of uh, significant foods like that ice cream pile that you see off to the right. Uh, I know it's tempting, but I, I think that it would probably be in your best interest not to eat those things. So let's talk a little bit about exercise next. So some of our early studies, this was from the, what we called the fatigue study that was done back in 2015, where we had over 1,700 MPN patients online respond to a survey. What was so interesting about this was this idea that there looked to be a bit of a, what we call a dose response between exercise and fatigue. This I, but it's also, take this as a grain of salt, it also could be the chicken and the egg. So what we saw is that patients who exercise more have the least fatigue. And you're like, well, Dr. Sherber, that makes so much sense. Uh, you know, of course, I'm not gonna go out for a five mile run if I am not feeling well. <laughs> so that very well might be what it is. But it also brings in this idea of, well, if you start to exercise more, could you help reduce your fatigue? And this also, uh, along with that, it was a recent analysis that we did with uh, uh, Dr. Hasselbach's uh, and his, his wonderful team, where we looked at our data analysis on body mass index and symptoms. And we looked at uh, their cohort of MPN patients which with uh, body mass index and symptoms. And what we were able to see is that for the majority of patients with all those little dots, there seemed to be a kind of a sweet spot where if you were right around that body mass index, which is um, it's a calculation of your weight versus your height, right around 25, which is right kind of in the, the middle group between normal weight and then just, just mildly overweight, but not obese, they seem to have the lowest symptoms. So this idea that maybe we could do something to try to bring people to that sweet spot. So one of the first studies that went on was 38 patients who we had complete a 12-week online yoga course. And around uh, the average participation was around 50 minutes per week. And in this, we saw that symptom burden did improve for a, for a fair amount of patients, as well as anxiety, depression, sleep, and fatigue. Uh, patients felt pretty satisfied with it. And this led us to a second study that we just published the results of, and this was the Yoga 2 study, where 
they had some patients who received yoga right away, and they had some patients that received yoga after a period of waiting. And we were able to compare the results. Overall, patients did participate in it quite well. And we saw an early decrease, an early signal, in decreases in inflammatory, one, at least one inflammatory marker, which was called TNF-alpha. Uh, there looked to be, although not significant, a decrease in interleukin-6. Now, what to make of this? Number one, this was not a dose response study. We didn't give people increasing amounts of yoga to show what, what the beauty is in terms of how much you should of yoga you should be participating in per week. And there are ongoing efforts to understand this more, but it does suggest that potentially some exercise is a good thing and that yoga might be one of those potential exercises that's somewhat uh, easy to participate in. Uh, especially make sure though, uh, in the, when they made the yoga, they made sure to uh, adjust it for people's spleen size. So if you have a large spleen, if you have blood clots or something else, make sure that you're being careful with the yoga. But this might have an effect, uh, at least an early effect on inflammation. Finally, cognitive interventions. So we have just also published the results of a smartphone mindfulness study where they actually used uh, two apps. One of them was the Calm app, and one of them was the Happier, Happier app. And they either put people, it was kind of a little bit convoluted how we did it. They either just uh, had Calm and then had Happier app, so they would do um, uh, a number of weeks on one and then a number of weeks on another, or they would do that the opposite, or they would get an educational control first and then one of the apps. Ultimately, what they saw is that, again, people were able to participate in these apps, but that there were reductions, especially for the call map, in anxiety, or sorry, in, yeah, in anxiety, um, depression, uh, sleep disturbance, uh, symptom scores, fatigue, and physical health. In patients that, when they were under this, the control, the just general education, they saw a little bit of improvement in physical health, which is not too surprising. We know that there can be some effect just by normal education. Um, but this is another thing that they're kind of looking at as potentially uh, something that might be good to do. And I'm not sure if any of you have ever tried the apps. They're actually somewhat easy to use. And I know it might sound, for someone who hasn't tried it, and I remember even me, I was a non-believer, if you would believe it. Um, it actually really puts you in the here and now when you do the apps. So it's basically focusing on, um, there's different ways to do it and different techniques that they use in the apps. But yeah, the ones that I've actually tried to start to implement myself is this idea that especially um, just at certain times during the day, and there, there does look to be kind of a sweet spot in how often you do this, just to focus on one thing and really put yourself in the here and now. So potentially maybe that's the feeling of your breath on one of your lips and just focus on that or feeling yourself breathing. It sounds so easy, but it actually can reduce stress levels, stress hormones, and they've shown that in other disease states, so it makes sense to try in MPM patients. The other thing is this is very safe. Everyone could potentially participate in this. We have another intervention that's been uh, in the works for a while now about acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, I won't go too much into this, but it's basically kind of working through different stages, similar to mindfulness, but a little bit different on how you can try to help um, basically be, again, be in the moment, but accept what's going on and then figure out what you can do to kind of move on from here. The bottom line, and I'll wrap this up, is that again, you know, Dr. Sherber, what should I come away from with this talk? It's the idea that out of all of our studies, this has probably been, to me, one of the most impactful. We looked at baseline quality of life and survival in a large cohort of myelofibrosis patients. And what we were able to see is that baseline quality of life was actually a predictor of survival. So that being said, I think that the number one thing you can do for yourself is find ways to maximize your quality of life. Be around people you love, do things that you enjoy, and try to be healthy. But I think the healthy factor is actually helping you to actually do those things that you love. And ultimately, you know, if, if this pans out, and obviously we haven't looked at a prospective study, but the idea is that you might actually be doing the very best thing for yourself that you, very, that you could be doing. Um, I'd like to thank you all in a kind of a wrap up. Actually, not too many people know I actually recently got married. <laughs> but... <laughs>